Okay. What you're looking at is the ComSail console. This is our management interface that we use to communicate with the ComServe. And uh, this particular application is a Java-based application. Uh, so this, you can install this. It's heterogeneous. You can install it on Windows, Linux, Macintosh, you know, put it on your desktop, your laptop. Distribute this to anyone in your environment who you want to take participation in data management activities. You may want to give a copy to your SQL DBA or your Exchange admin or maybe some help desk uh, folks. And then we can assign rights and permissions to these uh, folks. So when they log into the application, they're only able to affect their area that you give them permission to affect. But what we're looking at here first is the job controller. Now the job controller is going to show you any active jobs that are occurring in your environment. Um, as you can see, I've got a few operations here. Uh, let's take a look at this backup operation. I've actually suspended this just to kind of show you the type of data that gets populated in a, in a typical job. But you can tell there's a you can tell that you can see the job ID, the operation. At this point, it's a backup operation. But if you were running archive or a restore job or reporting, any of those activities will show up here. You can see the device that we're uh, performing the operation on. You can see that this is a backup. It's an incremental backup. We've got it suspended at 5%. If you want to get any more information about uh, any job, just double click, and you'll basically have a whole host of information in addition to that, the general uh, bar. If you want to control certain aspects of any of the jobs, it's a right click. At this point, I could resume this job. I could kill this job. I could change the priority. You'll have multiple jobs running in your environment, so you, you might want to bump one up over the others in the queue. You can view events or log files that are specific to this, um, this particular job. We can even send those log files to tech support with just the click of a button. Uh, I like this feature in, in using products in the past. Whenever I've had to send logs to support, I've had to you know, download them, zip, zip, zip them up, and then upload them to an FTP site in a specific folder, then call support and let them know. All that's mediated with the push of a button here. As soon as you click send log, send log files, by the time you call in, support's already got information about what we're talking about. And while we're talking about support, um, our support is based in Ocean Falls, I'm sorry, Tenton Falls, New Jersey, our new corporate uh, headquarters. Um, and they sit in the same building with our developers. Uh, if you happen to call after hours, we have offices in Australia and the UK as well. And we just got our scorecard for 2015, and we uh, were rated 98% customer satisfaction, which is the highest in the industry. Um, one of the reasons for that is it takes, on average, 30 seconds to talk to a person. So that's just one of the many reasons. But we're real proud of our support. Um, let's take a look at the event viewer now. The event viewer uh, looks very similar to the Windows event viewer, but we're only reporting on um, events that occur within the Commvault environment. Um, so we're not reporting on any OS layer or application layer events. Um, it's easy to add an alert for any event that you see in the event viewer. It's just a right click, and then you select Add Alert. This will take you through a wizard-driven process to create that alert whereby you can configure how you want to receive those alerts. So if you want the, the alerts to be emailed to you, if you want them to uh, utilize SNMP, uh, syslog servers, RSS feeds, um, you know, and, and a handful of others. So it's good to know what's going on in your environment without have, having to be plugged into it constantly. We're going to spend the majority of our time here in this ComCell browser, this smaller browser, and I'm going to start right at policies. Uh, some Commvault is, is heavily a policy-driven uh, architecture. So we're going to start with storage policies. Storage policies tell us a few things. You can have as many of these storage policies as you need in your environment, but they tell us three things. Where we're copying our data to, how long we're retaining our data for, and how many copies of the data that we're making. And the storage policies in this case, you can see my first copy is going to a disk target. Uh, this, is a, this is a primary copy. So you can make as many copies as you need to. The primary copy is the only copy that touches your production data. Um, all of these other auxiliary copies that we make will work off the primary data set, and they won't go back and touch your production environment. This, this secondary copy is a synchronous copy, and it's going to a disk uh, device as well. This is that dash copy we talked about earlier. 
So if you notice, both of these copies are deduplicated. And we, we've got the retention on this at 30 days. So we've, we're, we're, we're storing it a little bit longer on, on the secondary copy. Now this last copy is known as a selective copy. And this copy type uh, is going to, to a tape library device. We're holding it for 90 days. And we, we chose not to deduplicate this copy. Now, the synchronous copy is going to do everything the primary does. It's going to mirror everything, all the incrementals, all the differentials, the fulls, everything. The selective differs from the synchronous in the fact that we're not mirroring all the incrementals and the differentials. We're just concerned with the fulls. And here you can see we can choose from weekly, monthly, quarterly, biannually, annually, whatever makes sense for your business. But again, you can have as many copies as you, as you need to for your storage policy, and you can have as many different storage policies as you need to configure. So now that we've talked about where we're storing our data and how long we're, we're, we're storing it for, let's take a look at, you know, when we're actually going to be running our protection jobs. And that's going to, we're going to fall into the schedule policies now. For schedule policies, just like storage policies, you can have as many or a few of these in your environment as you need. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at this one. It's the one that I use for all my servers. And we'll take a look. In this one particular schedule policy, I've got both an incremental and a full backup configured. If you want to affect which clients we're going to apply the schedule policy to, we can, we can make the uh, selections here. We're just going to go ahead and take a look at this full schedule for now. Bear with me. Okay. Um, so the full schedule we've got uh, kicking off every week. Uh, it's on Fridays at 6 p.m. We've also got daily, monthly, yearly schedules. And for people who are um, protecting endpoint devices, as we discussed in the presentation earlier, we've, we've got an automatic schedule. So these are for devices, laptops, and desktops. They're not on the network 24-7. So we set minimums and maximum thresholds for when they log on to the network to kick off those protection schemes. We can even affect the minimum network bandwidth and things like CPU utilization as well. But since we're talking about servers, let's go back up here and look at our backup options. So these are, these are the backup uh, types that we have. We have the traditional full backups. We've got incrementals. We've got differentials. We've also got synthetic fulls. A synthetic full is where we take one full backup of your data, and then throughout the week we'll be taking incrementals. And then on the weekend, when you would normally be taking another full backup, we're going to take those incrementals. We're going to inject them into the, the previous full backup to give you a new full backup. So this type of backup works very well for file systems with lower rates of change, and it can really save on your backup windows and also the resources needed to drive those backups. So now that we've talked about some scheduling, we've talked about where we're storing our data, we've talked about when we're, we're kicking off the jobs, let's talk about what it is we're actually protecting. And what it is we're protecting is anything that we've installed an intelligent data agent on. As you can see, these are the, these are the systems that I'm protecting in my environment. When you install the agent, you can give it whatever name you want to give it. Um, but when you install that agent, there's two ways to install it. You can install it directly on the device, download it from our website, and, and run the installation procedure, or you can even push the agents out through this administrative interface. So you would right-click client computers, select new client, and then you have your pick of hypervisors, applications, clustered, and non-clustered file systems. So we're going to take a look first at the file system agent, and I've got a file system agent on my ComServe server, so we're going to go ahead and take a look at that. When you install it, it's going to build out in this familiar tree. So you're going to have your name, you're going to have your file system designation, you're going to have a default backup set folder, and then you're also going to have this default subclient. I've got another subclient that I've created. You can think of a subclient as a job. It's where you carve up the data that you're going to protect. So let's take a look at the default subclient. The default subclient is there. It's meant to be a catch-all. So let's go under content and I'll show you. As you can see, we're grabbing everything from the root, being that this is a Windows server. If you wanted to also back up the system state, we could designate the system state here. We're going to take a look at another subclient that I've created. And this one is specifically focusing on a couple of file shares. So let's go under content. Obviously, you definitely want to have VNSS enabled in most cases. Let's go to content. And here are the three file shares that I've got 
uh, that I'm protecting with this particular job. It's easy just to browse and add new, uh, add new file shares, edit the paths, add new paths. Uh, but these three file shares are what I'm protecting with this job. If there were files that people were putting on those file shares that didn't have any business value, things like MP3s, MP4s, um, and you wanted to exclude those from the backup, the filter section is where you can do that. Now you can set these filters up on a job-by-job -job basis, or you can set up a, a global filter and turn that on or off per storage policy uh, per agent. Um, if, let's say, this, those particular shares had subdirectories that were owned by marketing or training, and you didn't want, they had a business need for their media files and you wanted to make exceptions, we can make exceptions to the exclusions here as well. So you can get very granular with exactly what it is we're, we're, we're targeting. The Disk Cleanup tab, this is our one-pass feature. So this is where we set up our rules for archiving. And by archiving, I mean we can remove data from production storage and place it in an archive uh, storage target, whatever you designate, uh, and then we'll remove that from the backup cycle going forward. That file has been archived. And we can do this for both storage reclamation purposes and also for uh, legal, legal hold and e-discovery purposes. But here's where you set up the rules. Any file that meets these rules is going to be archived. It's the same job. It's the same passive data. So in this case, if the file was older than 90 days and larger than 20 kilobytes, those files would become archived. And then we give you the option of replacing those files with a stub. And a stub is a 4K shortcut. It's a, it's a way to give the end user the ability to restore that file back to the original storage. You can choose to delete the file as well. The storage tab is where we're going to configure which storage policy we want to utilize for this job. And in this case, you see I've just got a, a handful of policies in my lab. If you didn't have a policy that met your needs, you can create one very easily right here as well. These other two sub-tabs are for controlling of software compression and deduplication. So we can dictate whether those, are, those operations occur at all. We can turn them on, we can turn them off, or we can dictate whether they happen at the client or at the media agent level. Now, if you're gonna have it um, operate at the client level for deduplication, there's a couple of percentage points that it may add to your CPU utilization, but not much at all. So most people choose to leave it on the client and it saves a lot of time uh, and, and lowers the backup windows. Let's take a look at what a restore looks like for a file systems. Right click, browse and restore. And now while this is loading, we're gonna drill into the file system, but first we're gonna be met with this window. We can choose it from the latest backup, which is the default, or we can pick a time range. Maybe the file was alive in a backup set four weeks ago that didn't make it into the last one. So if you know the start and end times, we can target those dates and base the restore off of that. Or if you don't know the start and end times, maybe you just know a relative time. Maybe it was in the last 30 or 60 days. Um, you can select that as well. But we're just gonna go ahead and take this from the latest backup. Select view content. And these are the file shares that we designated as for, for protection. We're just gonna grab, you know, if we're gonna restore the whole file share, you can grab the whole thing, or we can just select a few files. And it's important to note that we are version aware. So if you had multiple versions of this PowerPoint or this Word doc, we can restore any or all of those versions. So to start the restoration, to get our options, let's uh, select recover all selected. And then now our options are, by default, we're gonna restore the data and the permissions uh, at the same time, but if you wanna restore one of the other, uh, maybe you have a folder where the permissions got corrupt, it's much faster just to restore the permissions. Um, here we can prevent any overwrite flags. We always put your data right back where we found it unless you tell us otherwise, we, and we give you the ability to do out of place restore. So if you come down here, any system, any server in your environment that has a file system IDA is gonna show up as a good restore target here. So I can select any one of these to, to restore th these files to. When you kick off a restore job, the, uh, the job initiation is immediate by default but we also always give you the ability to schedule your restores. Development teams uh, particularly love this feature. Uh, you know, they can have the last known good version of the database waiting for them when they walk in in the morning. Okay, that's file systems. And let's talk about, uh, let's talk about Exchange.
So when you install the Exchange IDA, we have a couple of different ways that we can protect Exchange. We can protect Exchange at the database level, or we can protect Exchange at the mailbox level as well. Let's take a look at the database protection, and here's that default subclient. So if we look at the contents, you can see I only have this one information store uh, in my lab here. But if you had more, you could come to configure and you can turn certain information stores on and off to select which ones you want to protect with this job. Go ahead and show you a restore. Let's just right click and select browse and restore. And then we're met with the same options. We're just going to take it from the latest backup. I'm just going to select the only one I have and select Recover All Selected. Okay. So now when I go to restore this database, if I have other Exchange servers in my environment with an Exchange IDA on them, they will show up in this list as good restore targets. And you can restore it to the original, or you can restore it to any other Exchange server that has the IDA in it. We could also restore it to another database or we could restore it <clears throat> out of place to a file location. And this, is, this is popular for people who want to do offline uh, mining of, the, of that Exchange database. So we have the ability to give you granular level restore of messages and, and mailboxes out of a database using an offline mining tool. And here's where you could designate the path when you restore this database. Let's take a look at the mailbox level protection. So we're going to have our default backup set and have our default subclient. And at this point, let's take a look at content. Instead of looking at information stores, now we're viewing it from a mailbox perspective. And I've got, you know, these handful of mailboxes in my lab. And just like turning that database on and off, we can do the same thing with mailboxes. We can come in here and hit the configure button and then select which mailboxes we want to protect. A lot of companies will only protect, uh, you know, a subset of, of people at the mailbox level. And so here's where you can get control over that. If you just want to protect certain folders and you want to exclude everything else, maybe you don't want to protect your tasks or calendar items, but you just want to protect your sent items and your inbox, just type them in here. Any other folders that are in your Exchange server will be excluded from protection. Archiving for, for mailbox level uh, backups is, is one pass supports that as well, and here's where you would set up the rules for that. Um, the archiving rules work you know, similar to the way we discussed with the file systems. You set maybe the, uh, the message is you know, three months old or six months old, whatever makes sense, and over a certain uh, you know, file size, those email messages will be archived. So they'll be removed from the Exchange server and placed into the archive repository, wherever you designate that is. Uh, and then we can replace those, those email messages with a stub so the end user can recall them. Um, we can also base it on quota, on use disk space and quotas, base the archiving, and then we can give you control over which attachments you archive, whether you want to always archive office documents and never archive things like EXEs and DLLs, things that could have, you know, potentially malicious code in them. All right, let's take a look at the restore process for Exchange Mailbox. Right click, browse and restore. We're going to take it from the latest backup. And now instead of loading information stores, we're going to, we're going to view, be viewing it from the mailbox level. And give it just a minute to load the indexes. Okay, so let's say that uh, Andrea Ring is on maternity leave, and she's out of the office, and her boss needs an, an email that, uh, that he knows she has in her inbox that he doesn't have. Getting just a little bit of network lag here while we wait for this loading screen. Okay, so at this point, we can go into Andrea's inbox, and we can pick out the emails that her boss is looking for. So we're just going to select a few. And we're going to recover all selected. And now our options are, if you had another, if I had another Exchange server in my lab, um, it would show up here. And you could cross-restore 
um, these messages to another Exchange server. Um, you can also, at this point, select who we want to um, send these emails to. So by default, they're going to be restored to Andrea Ring's inbox unless we designate otherwise. But, but this gives us the ability to actually take those, those emails, restore them to any other uh, mailbox on that Exchange server. So we could put that right into her, her manager's inbox. Taking a little bit of time to load my information here. Just bear with me for a minute. Okay, well, while this is, let's just kind of move right along here. I don't want to wait for my lab to – okay, so that's, that's Exchange. Now we're going to move to uh, VMware. So with, with virtualization, we have what's called our VSA, which I mentioned earlier. And the VSA uh, is a virtual server agent. Typically, the VSA is going to install itself on one of your media agent servers. And – it's going to act as, a, as a, a backup for all your file system data for your virtual machines. So we're not putting, you know, file system IDAs inside your, your, your virtual machines. Um, the VSA is covering all of that. So you would enter your vCenter credentials here, and then that's going to allow us to automatically detect and protect all the virtual machines that are being managed by vCenter. So the tree system is going to build out. You've got your default backup set. You're going to have your default subclient. Let's go in here and take a look at our default subclient. Okay, so there. If we look under content, the default subclient when you initially install it. Let me remove these so you can see what it's going to look like. It's going to have um, all unprotected virtual machines will be covered by the default subclient when you first initially install it. Um, but let's pretend that we're, you know, we're creating a new subclient to protect certain areas of your virtual environment. If we select Browse, we've got two, essentially two ways to configure what we're protecting. Browse will let you look through all your virtual machines in, in, in the vCenter and add them individually. And I've got a pretty small environment here, so I've only got just a few virtual machines. So if you wanted to do it manually, uh, we can select the virtual machines here through the Browse feature. Or you can use our rule-based system. If you click Add, we've got, we've got options here for creating rules. And so we can base these off of the, if you have a naming convention, the VM naming pattern. We can base it off a of host, data store, guest OS, guest DNS, host name. Uh, power state, notes, a variety of things, and our operators are here. So let's say we want to create a job where we're protecting uh, all the VMs on host number one. So at this point, if I run the job, we're going to protect every virtual machine running on host number one. But we can get you know, very granular. We can nest multiple rules together. In this case, let's say we have a naming convention. Let's select contains. And in here, let, maybe you've got production servers with PRD in the naming convention. And now if we run the, uh, the job, it's going to protect all the virtual machines with PRD in the naming convention on host number one. Maybe we didn't designate, you know, the virtual machines. We also have filters, just like we did for file systems, um, where we can filter certain things out. So in this case, we can, we can apply rules based on filters as well. So in this case, maybe we, we have uh, development machines on that same host, and we want to filter those out. And so now these will, these will skip over any development virtual machines on that host. We can even exclude virtual machine disks. So if you had a VMDK that was attached to a virtual machine, and you, and you didn't want to run a protection job on that, we can exclude those, those virtual machine disks as well. Another thing to note on all of our um, – on all of our sub-clients, we allow you to run your batch files or scripts on the pre- to post-process tab. So you can install those batch files or scripts here. 
Um, you know, maybe you have a custom developed application that we don't have an agent for, but you have freeze and thaw scripts that can pause and quiesce that application to, to take a clean backup. You know, we can accommodate that uh, at this point here as well. Also like to talk about IntelliSnap. I mentioned it early in the, in the presentation. Uh, here's where you would turn IntelliSnap on, and then you would need to select the appropriate hardware array vendor. As you can see, we have many, many um, uh, devices that we support. Uh, for a complete list of what we support, you can visit our documentation site at uh, documentation.comvault.com. But the IntelliSnap gives you certain benefits in a virtual environment, uh, namely re reduction in backup windows. Whenever you take a, a, you know, a VMware backup, we're, we're utilizing the VADP protocol. And a part of that process is taking a software snapshot of the virtual machines. The software snapshot process typically takes one to two minutes. It's fairly quick. But what takes uh, a long time is the processing of the data after that. It can take anywhere from half an hour to an hour. With IntelliSnap, we take a hardware snapshot immediately following the software snapshot, and that eliminates the processing of the data, giving you back that half hour to hour in that backup window for that particular job. So not only can it speed up your, uh, your VMware backups, but we can also take that snapshot, mount it up through a proxy, and drive a streaming backup from that snapshot. So we can off-host that, that job from the ESX host of VMware that the, 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 the virtual machine was living on. So let's take a look at some of the restore options that we have uh, for VMware. Again, it's just a right click, browse and restore. These are the four um, restore options that we have for VMware. We can restore the full virtual machine, any of the files that make up that virtual machine, we can take the MDKs and attach them to um, other virtual machines. We can do a granular guess or, or folder uh, and file level restore as well. If we're restoring the full virtual machine, we can actually restore that virtual machine to a uh, standard VMware machine. We can cross restore to a Hyper-V machine, an Azure or an Amazon virtual machine as well. Let's just go ahead and take a look at what a full virtual, virtual machine restore looks like. We're gonna just select view content. And these are the two virtual machines I have in my lab. I'll just grab one. You can see all the files that make up that virtual machine. Recover all selected. And so now here are our restore options for VMs. Um, by default, we're going to put that VM right back where we found it unless you uncheck this box. That's going to open up our restore uh, out of place options. So in this case, if you had another vCenter, we could restore that virtual machine to another vCenter. If you had more than one VSA, we can choose the VSA. If you want to designate the data store or the host, we can designate that. We can even rename the virtual machine upon restoration to prevent writing the original and maybe just getting a quick clone. For DR purposes, power on a virtual machine after restore, very popular item. Uh, we will restore the virtual machine with the original disk provisioning unless you tell us otherwise. We can, we can affect a, you know, thick or thin as needed. And then one of our newer features, Live Recovery, allows us to spin up a virtual machine from a backup and allow you to run that virtual machine. And this is useful for critical virtual machines that go down and you know you're going to have to restore that virtual machine, but you can't wait till the, the restoration has occurred to actually operate that virtual machine. We can spin it up from the backup, load it up through, uh, to vCenter through a proxy, and, and then you allow you to operate that virtual machine. And then once the re restoration has occurred, any delta changes between the two machines would be rectified. Let's also take a look at another restore, a guest file and folder level restore. So we do have some different options when we go into here. So we're going to select view content. And so now, instead of you know, looking at virtual machine files, we're actually drilling into the file system. And you can see from a granular level, we're just going to pick a few files. Same thing, version aware if you had multiple versions, recover all selected. And now this looks a lot like the file system uh, restoration options. So both data and permissions, either one in individually. 
Um, if you want to restore these files to a, a separate virtual machine, click this box and choose your virtual machine here, but then you would need the login credentials as well. Okay. Now we're going to take a look at our SQL agent. So I have a SQL server installed on my SharePoint server. So we are going to take a look at this one. Here's the default subclient. Go ahead and open that. And if you look under content, you can see I've got about 17 databases that, I've, that I'm protecting in this particular job. And, and like, uh, like the other agents we, we viewed before, if you click configure, it's easy to turn on and off you know, certain databases to give you that granular level control over what it is you're protecting with this job. Um, Let's take a look at this storage device tab because it is a bit different than your file system in your, in your exchange. The difference is we have separate storage policies that you can designate for your data and your log files. So if you wanna send those to different storage devices, you can just assign them different storage policies. We can also restore those independently as well, which I'll cover here um, next when we go over the restoration options. So it's a right click, browse and restore. Okay, um, we're going to take this from the latest backup. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to, before we get into that, I'm going to run a couple of reports because I'm going to show you reporting right after SQL. And I realized that these reports haven't run yet. So we're going to press run there, go to job summary. While these reports are running, um, I can show you the SQL restoration. So we're going to go ahead and at this point, we're just going to do a restoration on all the SharePoint uh, databases. One of my reports is already ready. We're going to select Recover All Selected. And here are the options that I have. Both reports are ready. Great. All right. So, you know, if you had other SQL servers, they're going to show up in this list. I've got a couple of SQL servers in my lab. We can restore, you know, this, these databases to any other servers that have SQL IDAs in them. We also have what we call a point-in-time restore. And a point-in-time restore is where we restore the data from the last backup, and then we play through the log files up into a point that you designate to return that database back into that specific point in time. We can even recover the database in an online mode, an offline mode, and a read-only mode. Uh, certain DBAs like to give their blessing before databases uh, are completely restored. We can also affect the path of where we're restoring this data. Uh, down here, independently for the data and the log files. And if you want to change any information, if you're going to change information, let's say we don't want to uh, restore these to C drive, we want to restore them to D drive. The find and replace button is an easy way to accomplish that. I call it my time saver button. So now replace all, and now we're, all those databases are being restored to uh, the new location. So now that our reports are run, let's take a look at them. The first port, re report we're going to look at is the ComCell Readiness Report. The ComCell Readiness Report is, is really a health check. It's, it's something that you're going to want to run before you leave for the afternoon, uh, especially on the weekends. It might have to, it could save you from coming back in over the weekend and uh, having to replace, uh, you know, put new uh, cleaning media in or whatever the problems may be. So in this case, you can see we've got 15 clients, and I'm showing some of my clients are offline. So we definitely need to address that issue before we leave for the day. Uh, disk library, I'm running out of space on this disk library, so we definitely want to make sure that we uh, rectify that before we leave. I'm running out of, uh, I don't have any cleaning media or, or any spare media. So this, you know, this configuration really needs some attention before, before I <laughs> try to leave for the day. And these reports um, can get fairly long. They're all color-coded, so 
pink is more of a warning. Um, red is definitely, um, definitely address this. But th there's a color-coded legend at the bottom of all these reports. So green's good. You know, pink's a warning. Red, red, red's bad. Now let's take a look at the job summary report. This is a report that you're going to want to run after your jobs have occurred. Um, so you can have this report, you know, scheduled and waiting for you, emailed in your, in your inbox, waiting for you in the morning so you know exactly how your jobs ran the night before. This, at the very top, you can see there's a summary of everything that ran. So the total number of jobs, the jobs that completed, do we have any complete with errors? Were there some that, that were killed uh, manually? How much data did we take in? So this is the amount of data that we're taking in. This is the amount of savings due to compression. This is the amount of data that we actually wrote to disk after compression and deduplication were factored in. Uh, so you can see any failed objects or folders. Um, we had a pretty good reduction. Just below this initial summary, they're, they're going to summarize all the jobs and categorize them based on the different clients. So you get a client by client breakout. But if you go down even further, below the summary, you're going to see a job by job breakout on the job summary. So in this case, any jobs that are white just means they didn't run. Green means they ran, everything ran fine. Now, there is a new field in this report that you didn't see in the summary up here, and that's the data size change field right here. So this one currently says, you know, 0%. Um, if, if your data size change rate is, you know, typically 3 to 5%, you know, and then you come back and it shows 90%, you know, that, that may be something that you want to pay attention to. Not necessarily there's going to be an error with it, but this, this box right here will be highlighted in white, and it'll do that if the change rate is greater than 10%. Uh, you can change that percentage, by the way, if you want to, but that's just the default percentage. And then color-coded legend at the bottom, a little more complicated here. This, this report can get pretty long depending upon, you know, how, how large of an environment you have in, in the activity. But this, this is just very easy to draw your eye to, you know, uh, attention that, that may need to be uh, provided. One other thing on reporting. Just wanted to kind of show you the, the amount of reports that we have. We have a fairly comprehensive reporting mechanism. Uh, most of these reports are fairly customizable as well. Uh, so if you want to uh, select certain things, you want to report against backup operations, you want to report against recovery operations, a variety of administrative uh, tasks as well. And then, you know, like I said earlier, you can select a time range on these as well. Just like the backups, we can, you can select, we want to pull data from a month ago, right? We don't want fresh data. Well, we can, we can dictate that here. And then these reports can be outputted um, by default, they're outputted in the HTML. They popped up just like you saw them earlier. But if we want to output them in text or PDF, and in some cases, XML, those are options as well. And then we can also dictate where these reports get sent to. If you want to just copy them on your local drive. You want to put them on a network share. You want to put them to an FTP site. And then you can schedule these and have them emailed so they'll be waiting for you when you walk in in the morning. Well, that concludes the software demonstration. Uh, portion. Uh, at this point, I would like to open it up for any questions.